Welcome everybody, glad to see you out tonight and the candidates, thank you for running. <laughs> and uh, I can only imagine the schedule you are on over these next several weeks and we are grateful to you and the sacrifice that you are making and that of your family as well to let you get out and represent Oregon. There are a few people here I would like to recognize before we get started, uh, just so that we can make sure that everybody is covered and recognize those that uh, are really are doing a great job as well. First of all, uh, Commissioner John Rashford, thank you, friend. Nice to see you. He's here, right there, Jackson County Commissioner. <laughs> Serving our community very, very well. Also, I understand we got Dave Daughter in the house. He's a candidate for state senate. And I think is our National Committee woman here, Bill? Not here yet, but Donna Kane will be here shortly. We want to recognize her. Uh, let's see here. Colleen Roberts, uh, candidate for Jackson County Commissioner. <laughs> Joel uh, Olenzon, Olenzi, excuse me, is here. Joel, are you here? Where are you? I saw you. There you are. There you go. Forgive me, I ruined your name. And let's see if I got everybody else here. I think we're okay. No, nope. nope. one more. No. Nope. Who? Gubernatorial. Who? Gordon Chalstrom. Gordon Chalstrom, uh, candidate Gordon. for governor. All right, Gordon, nice to see you. All right. A um, couple things here. Here are the rules. Uh, we're going to give each candidate uh, a two-minute opening statement. Uh, we have a variety of questions that have already been given to me, and each of you have a little card. If you'll take a few moments, if you have a specific question, and please keep it as specific as you can and uh, write your question on that card. And uh, Chuck, how are we gonna pick those up? Uh, we'll have. Do you want somebody around to pick those cards up? And we'll get them to you. Okay, we got people, we'll pick up the cards and we'll get them to you. I may call on you uh, to give your own question as the evening progresses here. And uh, each candidate will have 90 seconds to respond to a question. And uh, Andy here, this gentleman right here, he's our timekeeper. And he's going to give you a 30 minute warning before he shoots you with a dart. Okay? 30 seconds. Is it, is it a poison okay. dart? I'm just wondering. <laughs> and let me, uh, let me just say that our goal here tonight is to learn as much as we can what these candidates believe and what they stand for. Our goal is to keep it as civil as we possibly can. Obviously, the target here is not each other, but Senator Jeff Merkley. And uh, in fact, it reminds me of a little thing I have here today. I want to read this to you because I got this uh, just the other day. In church, I heard a sweet elderly lady in the pew next to me saying a prayer. It was so innocent and sincere, I just got to share it with you. Dear Lord, this has been a tough four to five years. You've taken my favorite actor, Paul Newman, my favorite actress, Elizabeth Taylor, my favorite singer, Whitney Houston, and now my favorite author, Tom Clancy. I just want you to know that my favorite politicians are Jeff Merkley, Barack Obama, <laughs> Joe Biden, Nancy Pelosi, and Harry Reid. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. With that, uh, let's uh, hear from the candidates, and we'll start with uh, Tim. Uh, you have two minutes to uh, tell us how great you are and what you're doing. All right. May I pull that up to you a little bit? Go ahead. Uh, thank you, and, and thank you all for uh, the opportunity to be here tonight uh, to speak with you all and to uh, to listen to your concerns as well. And uh, you know, I'm from Cottage Grove. I grew up. My, my name is Tim Crawley. I grew up uh, in a, uh, a son of uh, two uh, owners of a small business, and I was uh, went to school actually in Eugene, uh, St. Paul's, and then on to Marist High School. And from Marist, I then went to uh, college in, in Massachusetts at a, a liberal arts college, uh, uh, Williams. And, and uh, it, there, it was there that I ended up uh, playing uh, football and, and uh, studied and, and uh, was opened up to a, a, a wide array of, of uh, academic endeavors. And, and I ended up uh, majoring in economics and studio art, uh, traveled to the Middle East, uh, got, got accustomed and affiliated to the Middle East conflict. Uh, and, and have lived both in the West Bank as well as in, uh, in Israel. Uh, done quite a bit of work over there, overseas, and came back and uh, began working with the Federal Reserve and uh, spent two years with the Federal Reserve, uh, 
went to law school, worked down in Silicon Valley for a year and a half after law school, uh, and ultimately ended up coming back up to Oregon and, and to pursue my dream, which was to uh, establish uh, myself in, in law and, and, and in politics. So uh, that's why I'm here tonight, and, and uh, it's on behalf of Oregonians that this campaign is, is being uh, raised, and, and uh, what we hope to do is provide a voice for Oregonians who are, who are voiceless at the level of the federal government. Right now, the only people that have a voice are the largest entities in corporate uh, America uh, in our nation. So those are the only folks that, uh, those are the only entities that, that can afford a lobbyist to send to Washington, D.C. So we want to change that. Uh, and it starts right here with all of us. Great. Thank you, Tim. <laughs> Dr. Webby? Dr. Monica Webby, I'm the Director of Pediatric Neurosurgery at Randall Emanuel Children's Hospital, and I've been a leader in health policy at the state, local, and national level for about 30 years now. But I'm also the mom of four teenagers, and uh, when I decided to run for this office, one of my sons asked me, he said, Mom, why would you give up a job that you trained until you're 35 years old to do and everybody loves you to do a job where people say all sorts of mean things about you. And I told him about a, a brain tumor patient, a little teenager that had operated on, who came back to me with a thank you note that said, if we're not here to make life better for one another, then what's the point? And so I've always <coughs> thought about that, uh, and that's why I'm a pediatric neurosurgeon. I thought that was what, the, what I was meant to do and that I could contribute and use my talents. Doctors are problem solvers. We are trained to look at things logically, not ideologically. And we're also able to find common ground and work with other people. You can do that without sacrificing your principles. I'm not a politician, they're the ones who got us into this mess. They vote for laws they don't understand and leave the rest of us holding the bag and then point fingers at each other and blame other people. I want to be an advocate for you, not for special interest. I have a history of standing up for things I believe in. In 2009, I made, uh, as it ran across the country, uh, talking about the problems with this health care law that have now come true and I've continued to fight to repeal and replace us with a patient-centered approach. American families are struggling now, and that's because politicians are trying to treat symptoms instead of the disease. More Americans than ever are dependent on subsidies and welfare, but that's not who we are. We don't want to be micromanaged from Washington, D.C. We want to be free to pursue our American dream. So if we work together, we can get our country back on track. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Webby. Mark Callahan. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mark Callahan. I'm running for the U.S. Senate against Jeff Merkley. <laughs> I'm a father, I'm an average American, and I love our country. Sometimes bring my uh, daughters, Heather and Sarah, I'm with me on the campaign trail. They learn about civics real time. They help me pass out my brochures, and of course, I have to give them an ice cream cone afterwards. But uh, I, I'm teaching them about what our country is about. I'm teaching them about the freedom that our country was founded upon 238 years ago as a constitutional republic. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a lot of problems in our country right now. We have the NSA spying on us. We have the IRS targeting con our, our conservative groups. And we have Obamacare. We have Common Core coming down the pike. Ladies and gentlemen, these are an infringement on modern our freedoms, and it's time to take our country back. All I can do is teach my daughters what I believe in, and what I believe in is this, leadership, integrity, character, honor, and trust. It's what we have all within each of us to get our country back on the right track, as I said, to get it back on the right track to freedom. And that's the message that we've been spreading across Oregon, and it's being embraced by the non-affiliated voters, the independents, Democrats, and Republicans. It's that one message of freedom that we all want and we all need to get our country back on the right track. My name is Mark Callahan. I'm running for the U.S. Senate against Jeff Merkley. Let's get to work. Thank you, and may God bless America. Thank you, Mark. Representative uh, Jason Condor. 
I'm Jason Conger. I live in Bend, Oregon. I am an attorney and a husband uh, in 25th year of uh, marriage. Better not forget that. <laughs> Gotta count backwards. Um, I have five children, one of whom is here with me tonight, and uh, I'm proud to represent my community in the Oregon legislature for the past three and a half years. We all see the same news reports, we all know the bad news, and I'm not here to tell you any more about that. I'm here to remind you of the good news, that in 2014 we have an almost unheard of opportunity to unseat a Democrat incumbent, incumbent U.S. Senator. The main reason Jeff Merkley is vulnerable is because of his role in all of the bad news that we see today over the last six years. The harm that has been done to tens of thousands of Oregonians because of his actions and his inactions. We know that we have the right ideas. We know we have the right solutions or we wouldn't be here. In fact, if you think the country's going in the right direction and we don't have better ideas, you came to the wrong meeting. We know we can do better, but we don't get to see the light of day unless we start winning elections. And in order to do that, we have to change our voice as conservatives. Now let me be clear, when I say change our voice, I don't mean abandon our principles, I don't mean selling out, and I don't mean forgetting the values that made us conservative in the first place. Exactly the opposite, because we need to contrast with the Democrats. No Republican is going to win statewide in Oregon by being more of a Democrat than the Democrat. And we need to focus on the good news. Remember that. We need to focus on what we can do, not just what's bad, but what we can do to fix it. Because people need to hear it. They're crying out to hear a voice that is positive, a voice that we can give them as conservatives. I'm Jason Conger, and I too am running against Jeff Merkley for the U.S. Senate, and I look forward to your questions tonight. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Go Ray Perkins. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for coming out to listen to us. This is truly very important. My name is Joe Ray Perkins. I do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, both foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, take this obligation, obligation freely and without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office on which I'm about to enter, so help me God. That is the oath of office that I will be taking in January 2015. It is the same oath of office, almost word for word, that every person in the military takes. We have people in Washington, D.C. who are voting away your liberties, your freedoms, and your rights. We've got men and women who have signed up and put their lives in the line to defend the Constitution to defend your freedom, your liberties, and your rights while people in Washington, D.C. are voting those away. And folks, that is wrong. It is time that we get a Main Street American who understands what the majority of America goes through today, who understands that we cannot have an overarching government that is violating the Constitution day in and day out, that is trying to bleed more tax money out of you when you're going to have anything left to give. My background is in financial planning and investments. And as a financial planner, I had the fiduciary responsibility to prudently manage my client's money. I had to be very careful with their money. I will take that exact same theory and that exact same vision to Washington, D.C. It is not the government's money, it's your money. I'm happy to be here. I'm going to ask for your votes on May 20th. But more importantly, your prayers and your support. What do I got, 10 seconds left? Am I out of time? Oh, okay, good. He put up the sign and threw me off. That's just enough. Um, I'm married. Today is my 38, 36th wedding anniversary. We've been together 41 years. My husband is at home in Albany getting ready to go watch the Blazers play and hopefully win tonight. We've got two adult children and 10 grandchildren. So um, there's, a, there's a lot of things going on out there, and there's a reason that we've got to fight for this country. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Grandkids, aren't they wonderful? 
They're your reward for not killing your own. <laughs> I'm teaching my two grandsons how to leave their dad's tools all over the yard. It's warmer. <laughs> Um, all right, just want to remind you the rules. Here's the rules. Uh, we're going to ask the same question to each candidate. That way you can, uh, they each have an opportunity to respond to those specific questions. Thank you for getting your questions to those coming up and down the aisles. They're going to help me put them in categories so that I can easily refer to them. And then uh, each candidate will be given 90 seconds to, to respond. And Andy here will give you a 30 second warning. I'm going to start with, uh, since he's in the room, where'd he go? Commissioner Rashford, there he is. Hi, John. You have several questions here, and I don't know which one you consider the most important, but why don't you stand and ask one of your questions? Sure. Uh, I'll ask the GMO question. Uh, we have a ballot measure that's going to be here in Jackson, in Jackson County, uh, outlawing the uh, growing of GMO products in Jackson County. And I'm wondering if this was a, a nationwide, came to a nationwide issue would the candidates be in favor of a ban on growing GMOs, which some European countries have that ban? So would they be for or against it? Okay, thank you. We'll start down at the end. Joe Ray, we'll start with you. We had this question very similar earlier, so thank you for your question when we were yeah, up in Grants Pass. It's a complicated issue. But I think that when God created everything, I think he got it right the first time. It seemed to me that the food source seemed to work pretty good. And folks, it's not a food shortage problem. It's a food distribution problem. That's where the problem is. When we start monkeying around with the food and genetically modifying it, we're causing issues, many of which we are still trying to figure out, the medical community is still trying to figure out, but I wonder, why do we have this explosion of autoimmune diseases? I wonder if there's a correlation between what we put in our bodies and our health issues. A couple of years ago in China, the watermelons started exploding while they're still on the vine. Why? Because they had modified them because they wanted them to be bigger. Now, I don't know how much bigger you need a watermelon, but they wanted them bigger. They started exploding. The corn borer beetle, when it eats and bites into the corn, its intestines explode, and we're putting that in our body. I had an incident with Splenda. And somebody told me, they go, do you understand that Splenda has chloride in it? Yeah, whatever. My son says, Mom, Splenda's not good for you. Well, I looked it up. Sure enough, two sugar molecules have been replaced with two chloride molecules. Well, I was having this strange thing going on in my mouth that felt like thrush. And I went to the oral surgeon. They could find nothing. But, hmm, I wonder if there is a correlation. I stopped the Splenda. Guess what? Problem gone. So I'm figuring, if I can tell on my own body just one product that I know firsthand but that was the direct cause of what was causing me to have these problems, then what of all the other things that we're ingesting? I think as consumers, even though I like a small government, I think it is prudent, and I think we should demand, the market should demand upon the producers that they tell us what is in our foods that we are consuming. Ding. Are these genetically modified? Ding, ding. Thank you. Thank you. Forgive me, I don't want to be rude, but I'm going to try to watch no, the time as quickly as we can. You're great. All right. Uh, Jason. Well, uh, so the question was nationwide ban, right? Would you support a nationwide ban, John? Um, no, I would not support a nationwide ban at this time. Uh, I have a lot of concerns about the health effects of uh, the unknown health effects of the the, the cumulative, I should say, effects of chemicals, um, genetically modified foods, uh, things that we have all around us in our environment all the time, things that are largely invisible to us as consumers um, that we don't have the ability to evaluate the risks of. Um, I, I, I'm very concerned about those things because I've experienced uh, an invisible poison uh, with my daughter uh, on the East Coast in lead dust. And my infant daughter uh, got a, a blood test and it showed that she had very, very bad lead poisoning. Um, and that's when I learned that you don't see it, you don't smell it, but it can harm her for life. And we were very fortunate because they do a surface check first and, you know, because she's a tiny baby, they do a skin prick. And we had the intravenous test um, and it turned out it was lead on the surface of her finger. So we got out of the house we were in but that illustrated to me that a lot of times we don't have any way of knowing how we're being harmed. 
and, and the effect on her would have been horrible. It would have affected her IQ, her, her uh, behavior, um, her physical health, because it's a very powerful neurotoxin, totally invisible, had no idea. Um, so, would I support a, a nationwide ban? The short answer again, as I started, was no, because I think, uh, I know that GMOs are a huge part of our uh, food supply, and if we don't have them, I'm afraid people would starve. But do we need to be looking at it? The answer is yes. All right, Ding. <laughs> Thank you. All right, uh, Mark. Well, I'm a believer in the free market. I'm a believer in limited government. So if there is a demand for increased uh, description on the foods that we eat and consume, the free market will take care of it. I mean, people will sell, start selling products with, the, with more labeling on it to satisfy the consumers that are buying those products. I don't think we need to get the government involved because that would just grow the size of government in terms of labeling products or being mandated to label products. So as long as it's based upon, a, we can come up with a free market solution, also balancing it with limited government, that's what I would be for. Thank okay, you. thank you, Mark. Uh, Dr. Reddy? I uh, don't support a ban not genetically, or on our GMOs, genetically modified organisms, because, you know, these, these modifications have allowed us to use less pesticides. They've been, and it, I'm sorry, my voice is coming up. They've allowed us to um, use less pesticides, which is good for our environment. They've allowed our uh, crops to be more resilient in drought uh, and more resistant to certain type of diseases. So we've been able to increase food production in a lot of areas where we weren't able to grow food before, we're able to grow now. And this is a huge part of supply and demand for our food uh, both uh, globally and nationally. Um, if, to my knowledge, I don't know of any uh, proven uh, bad effects from uh, GMOs, and if this is something that we need to study. And we do have the FDA available to do these studies. And if the FDA does a study and finds that there is something wrong with a, uh, with a GMO, uh, at that point, then they could require labeling. Until then, I think that this is an option that if people want to label that their you know, product is non-GMO, they can. Uh, but the problem is that when we get into a patchwork of different uh, regulations all across the country, that makes it very, very difficult. So uh, I think we have to be careful about fear-mongering if we don't have any evidence that there are things wrong, uh, particularly when there is so much uh, need for, for food in, in the world. Okay. Thank you, Doctor. Um, <laughs> Tim, sorry, you're the last one right in front of me here. <laughs> you know, at this time, I don't think that it would be prudent to, uh, to look, look at a GMO ban with, within our, nationwide that is. Uh, this is an issue right now that we're starting to deal with on a local basis. Uh, we need to continue to do that, and uh, we also need to do it with the, uh, with, with the understanding that uh, major corporations in the United States have hijacked and controlled our food sources for a very long time. So that being noted, uh, we need to be moving in the direction of, of allowing more information to our consumers. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, the next question uh, comes from Tom. On April 19th, uh, there will be a signing of the Klamath Tribes and the Upper Klamath Irrigation District. The question is, do you support the Klamath Basin Restoration Agreement, better known as the KBRA? We'll start with you, Tim. I would say that uh, overall it's, a, it's and I, know, I don't know too much about it, but from what I do know about it, it does take uh, away local control. From, uh, from the people in Klamath, and that's, that's um, not the direction that we need to go in as a nation. We need to go in uh, with, it, with the idea that, that federal politicians should be conduits back to the people. And this includes managing water rights. When we, when we see that water rights, resources, are controlled by the federal government, we see mismanagement. This occurs across the boards. We see this in the roundup of wild horses in Oklahoma. We see this in dealing with 
var variety of species across the nation, including right here in Oregon, with respect to the spotted owl and the barred owl. There, are, there is mismanagement happening everywhere across the boards. So we need to put back, back the ability and the, uh, the uh, power to, for the local citizen to be able to determine uh, how they're going to use their resources. Okay. Uh, Dr. Remy? I agree with Tim about this, that, that we do have to have local control. It's always better than federal control, else we end up with all the unintended consequences that are going to happen here. If we do restrict the water to our farmers in, in this area, we're going to have a, a tremendous difficulty with, with our, our farmers being able to have their livestock and, and uh, vegetation and be, uh, being able to, to protect their livelihood. I can't remember anything that uh, the federal government's been able to do better than we're able to control locally. And when they start meddling with what we're trying to do uh, in our communities, uh, it, it always uh, ends up in a bad way. Okay. Mark? I also believe in local control of natural resources in terms of water rights and land rights. We have very rich natural resources in our, in our county and our state. And unfortunately, they're being mismanaged by the federal government. So I advocate for local control of natural resources um, of our water rights and our, our timber and our minerals as well. Thank you. Okay. Good. Jason? Look, I don't know the exact terms uh, of the Klamath Basin Restoration Act. Um, what I do know is that uh, the battle for water resources is uh, is ongoing, and it's probably going to get worse, not better. Um, I know that uh, other states have it a lot worse than Oregon, but in particular areas uh, like the Klamath Basin, where where there are large um, uh, uh, federal ownerships, um, and and there are tribal issues and other things that are that create kind of a, a tension. An additional tension on the water rights uh, that, that's going to be an ongoing problem. With that said, I don't think that um, there is any justice in a farmer who, whose family may have been farming uh, the same land for a hundred years suddenly losing their irrigation rights and I, I kind of question whether or not uh, a permanent property right hadn't already been created and if taking it away wouldn't be a taking of property which is unconstitutional without compensation, without just compensation. Um, so I'm very uh, concerned about the implications for people who have farmed and, and ranched for uh, generations uh, on the land and very concerned about you know what the uh, what the countervailing force is uh, Again, without having read it, I'm not going to make a, a blanket statement of support or opposition, um, but I'm certainly leaning towards opposition based on what I do know about it. Okay, thank you. Joe Ray? Yeah, I've only read cursory information on this issue as well, but it seems to me that there wasn't really, and I could be wrong, so I'll put this thing around there, that that the, the problem was created by the government saying remove the dams. And that it appeared that it got exacerbated when they went, am I incorrect? I'm incorrect, okay, I'm seeing this head shaking, no. Okay, so I'm just, like I said, it's just cursory information that I have. Nothing to do with the dams. Has nothing to do, okay, that's what the reading was talking about, the dams. See, I'm, I can be corrected really easy. <laughs> But when we have the government starting to intervene in areas that were working before, it causes me questions. In California, they just had this drought because they had to wash all kinds of water. They had an aqueduct system that was set up that could hold five years of rainwater. Why? Because in California, they knew that there were droughts. They were prepared for the droughts, but yet environmentalists came along and said, oh, you need to make sure that we save the smelt, a bait fish. And so that water, where did it end up? in the Pacific Ocean. And what about all those farmers? So my concern is, is that we would have a very similar scenario starting to play out over here in the Klamath Basin. I think local control, people that understand the environment and the weather patterns is where this needs to remain and get the federal government out of it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, very good. All right, uh, let me just kind of mix it up. 
Are we there? There we go. Okay. Uh, we'll start with you, uh, Dr. Webby. Uh, let's, what is your position? You know, it's an incredible issue. It looks like the U.S. House of Representatives kicked the can down the road and won't deal with it in this election cycle. But where do you stand on the whole subject of immigration? Well, of course, the first thing we have to do is secure our borders. And I don't think we really have any idea how secure our borders are. Sometimes some, some people say they're 95% uh, secure. Some people say they're porous. So we don't know. Second of all, I uh, don't approve of amnesty. I don't think it's fair to those who came here legally and who followed the law. But I uh, also don't think we're going to be able to round up everybody and send them home either. I think we have to find a way to find out uh, who is here and find a way to give them some sort of legal status, whether it's a work visa, whether you can come and go, seasonal workers that can come and go and help with our agriculture, whether it's um, uh, you know green cards or, or other types of visas, but we need to know who's here. It's a national security issue. You know, we can't just have people running around without knowing where they are. And the other issue is that at some point, and once we make these people, give these people some sort of legal status, then they can pay taxes and start contributing to society as well. I also believe that uh, we need to find a way to give uh, some sort of legal residency. Um, and when they have that legal residency, at that point, if they want to become citizens, that should be an opportunity for them, but they should go to the back of the line and pay a penalty, and, and uh, just like everyone else who comes to this country. Okay, thank you. Mark? Well, you'll find that I'm a, a man of very few words, but I'm short, sweet, and to the point, and very direct. So a three-point plan, enforce the borders, or secure the borders, enforce existing law, say no to amnesty. It's just that simple to me. Secure the borders, force existing law, say no to amnesty. We have a gang of eight in Congress right now that actually went down to Arizona, and they actually saw someone climbing over the fence. And I'm thinking to myself, existing laws aren't being enforced here. We don't have a secure border. And so while we all concentrate, while they, this gang of eight concentrates on new laws, why don't they just enforce existing laws in addition to saying no to amnesty, and turning off the spigot to secure the borders. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jason. I agree we need to secure the borders. Uh, I certainly agree that uh, amnesty is not a good policy. I don't think uh, if you're gonna have a law, and you know we could have a, a longer discussion about whether or not we should have immigration law like we do now, um, but if you're gonna have a law, exactly the wrong message to send to people is that you're not going to enforce it. I mean, um, so no amnesty. Uh, I do agree that we need probably to reform our work visa program so that people who come for seasonal work um, are actually here during the season. And, uh, you know, it makes a lot more sense if you're, if you're going to have um, workers coming into the, the country to do that, that kind of work uh, to match that. Uh, more closely with the allowing them to enter the country legally and leave the country legally. Um, as far as uh, the idea that you just enforce the existing law, we can't uh, do that. Uh, you know, I, somebody uh, advocated to me just kick them all out, and I tried to picture 10, 12, 15 million people being rounded up and sent across whatever border they came in on, and I cannot imagine it. I know that if, if we think that through, I doubt that many people would uh, believe that's the right outcome. So we do have to work on some kind of program to get them uh, registered. And uh, I like the idea of sponsorship. So if they have an employer or a church where they've been attending for a long time, to tell them you can have uh, a work visa, but you need a sponsor. So, and, and you need to not obviously have a criminal background. Yeah. Thank you. Joe Ray? Clearly this is an issue that to answer it in 90 seconds does not really do it justice. But let's start first with securing our borders. And I'm going to say some things that may be shocking to some of you here. I'm going to tell you the truth. 
I'm not going to mince words when I do it. When Bill Clinton signed into law the NAFTA agreement, what he was really doing was setting up the per precursor to the, to the North American Union. You hear them talking about securing the borders. Why aren't they? Because they don't intend on it. Where was Obama a few weeks ago? In Mexico, with the President of Mexico, the Prime Minister of Canada, to discuss additional free trade. I'm sorry, I thought that's what NAFTA was about. Free trade. No, it was more about more, about more government regulations and how to bring these three countries together. That's really the truth. And that is why our borders are not being properly secured. What's the answer? Get somebody in there like Joe Ray Perkins that will tell you the absolute truth and say we've got laws on the books. We have an Immigration Act. It needs to be rewritten. It is so convoluted, it is crazy. I sat down and started reading it one day and went, oh my God, I think I'm gonna need a month to get through this because of all the rabbit trails that it goes on. As far as immigration, I talked to a lady who immigrated here from Mexico, and this is what she said to me. Send them back, put them at the back of the line, have them pay their back taxes, and they come back over in their line. So in order to be able to get that done, as Jason said, we're not heartless people. We need to do it in a manner that's going to make sense. For those, if we decide to send them back is not prudent, then let's talk about a form of permanent residency, but no citizenship. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead, Kim. Yeah, this is really a two-part question, dealing both with borders as well as the current 11 to 20 million immigrants that are currently here in the United States. Uh, I'll begin with the 11 to 20 million immigrants that are currently here. Uh, these folks, I mean, I, I sort of view this as, a, uh, as the best way to handle this as a market approach in the sense of we, we implement a, a system of E-Verify for employers. Uh, that if, if that's implemented well, then there's then we can increase penalties for hiring as well. Uh, the non non legal uh, I should say uh, yes non legal uh, residents here in the United States. So I think it's very important that we that we uh, look at both of those elements, both the e-verify as, very, as well as increasing penalties, because then the onus isn't on anyone. It's it's spread out between the people that are not abiding by by the procedure that's in place. Uh, the the first issue I mentioned was borders, and this is a very important issue because uh, I'm very much against uh, the building of, of, of walls anywhere. Uh, I, I don't believe that they work or that they're cost efficient. And it's, uh, I've seen them, I've seen one, for example, in Israel and Palestine, and uh, it creates more division and doesn't necessarily solve the root of the problem. So uh, I, I wouldn't advocate for that stance. Uh, our military personnel are completely capable of handling this situation on the board. Okay, thank you. Okay, is um, Gary Miller in the room? Yes. Stand up and ask a question. Oh, good. I didn't think you would ask. Just like you wrote it, Gary. No other way. Sure. Just, just no other way? No, nope, just like you wrote well, it. Can I change it just a little bit? <laughs> okay, in, the, in Congress now, we have too many people who are rhinos. How will we know that you will not be a rhino? Okay, we'll start with Mark. <laughs> I can tell you I'm not a rhino. Um, I'm, I'm not establishment. I'm kind of outside the establishment. I'm not a career politician. I'm just an IT guy by trade. I fix computers for a living, so I'm a problem solver and troubleshooter. So I'm a little bit, I'm, I am outside the establishment. I'm uh, just doing what I can with the resources I have. I'm just the father out there on the trail is what I am. So a couple of my heroes in Congress currently are Ted Cruz and Rand Paul, in addition to Mike Lee. So, I, I know they kind of stand outside the mainstream, although I do appreciate uh, Ted Cruz standing up in the well of the Senate for 21, 22 hours or something. I wish I could have been there with him at the time. But uh, that's a great American right there. Rand Paul is a great American. Mike Lee is a great American. So that's who I admire. I hope that answers your question, sir. Okay, uh, Jason. So a, a rhino, by definition, is not really a Republican. And I've been a Republican ever since I could vote. Um, I became a Republican, uh, actually I was, came from a very liberal family, extraordinarily liberal, and uh, uh, you know, was brought up with my dad ranting about how great Michael Dukakis was. And, and I know, hard to believe. Um, so it wasn't a stretch for me to look at Ronald Reagan and say, this is the kind of vision I want for my country. This is the kind of man who 
we need leading us. Um, Ronald Reagan was not perfect. Uh, he definitely did some things that people don't agree with, um, but what he had was principle and vision, and that's what we need uh, again in this country. And I'm just praying that uh, a leader like that will step up and lead the Republican Party in the next presidential election. Um, so the answer is I can't possibly be a rhino because I've always been a Republican. And uh, uh, the other, uh, I guess, obvious point is, you know, look at my voting record and look at the things that I've stood for consistently, vocally, publicly, ever since I started running. Lower taxes, um, uh, balancing the budget, having adequate reserves, not borrowing more money. Um, investing in infrastructure though, you know, having a purpose for government where uh, it's, it's fulfilling its purpose, um, but not at the expense uh, you know, of, of taking more of our money than is absolutely necessary to do it. Um, and I, I could go on, Second Amendment, uh, pro-life, uh, not in favor of gay marriage, I imagine we may have questions about those things. Um, and I'm happy to explain my positions on them, but I, I don't think that fits anywhere near the definition, if there is one, uh, of a rhino. Uh, thank you. You all right? One of my favorite little books that I read years ago was, was called Rhinoceros Success. It had nothing to do with being a rhino. <laughs> but what the book did talk about was having a tough skin and a soft heart. When you're in Washington, D.C., you've got to have a tough skin to stand up against the political machine, to stand firm on your, on your core values of who you are, and that's who I am. I cannot get away from the core of who I am. It is just not possible. I've been involved in the last three state of uh, Oregon Republican Party platform conventions. I ascribe to every one of our platform planks, every one of them. When I helped write some of them, I helped craft some of the wording that's there today. So in order to become a rhino, I would have to completely sell out who I am to my core, and that is just not a possibility. I don't have a problem standing up against men like Mitch McConnell and John McCain. I believe in standing firm on what the Constitution says is the role of the United States Senate in the United States House. That's who I am, and I will only vote on those measures that are constitutional. Thank you. Tim? So the question was, how, how do we ensure that we don't either become rhinos or are, are rhinos in, in Washington, D.C.? And, and, you know, I, I think th there are certain principles of the Republican Party that need to be uh, put forth in, in, the, in the forefront. Uh, and those principles are emancipation and women's suffrage. These were both principles that the Republican Party advocated for. And they're, I, they're, they're principles that nobody can really argue with either. And so, with that in mind, I think it's important to establish that as the premise uh, for people to uh, see the Republican Party that way. Uh, you know, this, there, our campaign is very much about building consensus. And what that means is identifying the common features that folks hold and focusing on that to build constructive solutions to the problems that we face. It's those constructive solutions that are going to lead our country out of debt and back on the right tra track with respect to uh, building our small businesses, building our, our, our medium businesses, and giving back to the individuals the freedoms that they originally had. Yeah. Thank you. Dr. Webby? What is it that we believe in as Republicans? We're fiscal conservatives. We want lower taxes, less regulation, we want the government out of our life, not meddling in every single aspect of our life. We want personal freedom. We want to reward success. We want to know if we work hard, we can get ahead. Those are values of our Republican Party. We want personal responsibility. We want to know that if our kids work hard, that they're going to have the same opportunities that we had. And I think what we have got to do as a Republican Party is stick together. When we start dividing up over issues, we lose. We lose. When we divide up our party, when we vilify each other, we're a big tent party. You know, we've got to respect the differences that we may have. We may have some minor differences. We may not agree on everything. 
But if we don't stick together, we're going to have Jeff Merkley back in there again. Okay. Um, got some great questions. I hope we can get them all in. Um, as you know, the president is now basically governing through executive orders. If you were elected to the U.S. Senate, what would you do to stop it? We'll start with Jason. Well, the first thing I'd do is make a list of those executive orders, figure out the ones that were illegal, and uh, pass a law that uh, invalidates any executive order that violates statute. That's a repetitive law because uh, it's not necessary, but the point is to bring out the list of executive orders that it, where the president is legislating rather than serving as the executive and implementing the laws, executing our laws. Uh, the legislate, you know, we have a, uh, I think probably everyone in this room would identify themselves as a patriot. And part of the reason that we are patriots is because we have a constitution that provides for checks and balances in government. Those checks and balances have been eroding for a long, long time. That's true at the federal level, it's true at the state level. Um, the idea was to prevent one person from being the master of the military and the head of all of the agencies of the government and all the instrumentalities and the force that comes with that and also be the one to write the laws. Uh, it is absolutely uh, unacceptable uh, to have, and, and, and actually, let me step back and be totally fair to our current president. The Republicans do it too. You know, the Republican presidents do the same thing. Maybe not as bad. Uh, president Obama seems to be taking it to a whole new level. But the point is, every time everyone does that, they're undermining the system. And, and the system is what we value, not the individual, it's the office. Uh, that they hold and in the, the constitution and the structure of government that is, uh, that is magical and is unique to America and is something we cannot afford to sacrifice. Joe Ray? I looked through the constitution. I didn't see anywhere where it says that the president has the right to executive order. It's not listed. So for to have this man Say he has a cell phone and a pen. It's a slap in the face to our checks and balances and to our republic. Executive order is nothing but a bunch of traditions like pardoning a turkey at Thanksgiving. That's really what it is. And it was really meant for minor issues, not these big things that he's doing and completely changing the country. You know, when he ran, he said, I will fundamentally change America. I will submit to you, he has been one of the most successful presidents ever. He has, right before our very eyes, fundamentally changed this country. So what am I going to do? When I'm in Washington, D.C., I'm going to get together with my friends in the House and go, go look, impeach him now. We will try him. When I looked in the Constitution, the very first duty of the United States Senate, Senator, try impeachments. And I look forward to doing that in January of 2015. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So it's, the question is what to do about uh, executive power and its, and its expansion at this point. And, and I think that uh, where the real root of the issue lies is in spending. The Congress is authorized to allow the executive to spend to enforce the laws. And, for example, the increase in, in federal workers' minimum wage, there's a perfect example of, of the, uh, President Obama uh, using that executive power to, uh, to make, it, make a ruling. And this is ultimately controlled by pal uh, Congress's ability to control spending. And, and that's where it all starts from. It starts from every, every bit of that deficit that our government is incurring right now starts with Congress. So from that standpoint, we need to analyze where President Obama has stepped over the line and make sure that that, uh, that, that spending does not occur. Great, thank you. Dr. Rubin? I think we have a real problem with this imperial president of ours. 
He's showing no uh, regard for the checks and balances in the Constitution. This was not supposed to be a one-man show. And look what's happening. Look at the chaos that it's doing. Look, look what's happening to our economy. Look at this health care law where he just willy-nilly keeps, you know, delaying parts, changing parts of the law. It, all the uncertainty out there, nobody knows what the rules are. Nobody knows what's going to happen. Nobody can plan for anything. Look at this uncertainty. They know it's a bad law, and he just so happens to always push the deadlines past the next election uh, over and over again. I'm sure there's nothing political about it. But uh, just and when uh, Senator Coburn was here with me last week, and uh, this question came up over and over, what are we going to do to stop this? And the problem is that you can't just stop it unless you have somebody that's been injured and has legal standing. So what you do is you find the problem. You have to find somebody that's been injured, and then you have to sue, and it takes years. So what we can do now, what has to be done now, is the people have to not take it anymore. Their people have to complain. There has to start being a problem with people and, the, and with the public because the lapdog media let him get away with everything. Look at Benghazi. Look at the IRS. You know, you keep telling these lies over and over and over, and they let him get away with it. So until we stand up and fight it as a people, it's going to keep going on. Thank you. I'd say impeach and convict. Um, kind of keep it short and sweet and to the point here. Impeach and convict. But we have to have a couple things happen first. We, one, we have to maintain our majority in the House. Two, we have to take back the majority in the Senate. We have a, we have a president, as, as Joe Ray said, that's leading with a cell phone and a pen, or a pen and a cell phone. That's unaccountable behavior. That's imperial dictatorship, folks. And that's not what our country's about. So we need to maintain the House take back the Senate, stop some of the stuff he's doing, and when he continues to do it, I'm not going to hesitate to convict that guy should the House actually grow a spine and actually be able to impeach him. Thank you. Okay. All right, we'll start down with you, Joe Ray. This question came in. In 2009, in Washington County, a pregnant woman was attacked and killed, and her unborn child was gruesomely cut out of her. Because of Oregon law, the attacker was only charged with one murder. Had this happened in California, the attacker would have been charged with two murders, the death of the mother and the death of the unborn child. The question is, in your mind, is the murder of a pregnant woman a killing of one human being or two? That is so easy. That is the killing of two human beings. There's no question about it because, I'm sorry, what else is she carrying? It's a human. Right after Roe v. Wade was passed, there was another bill that was passed that a lot of people don't know. It's called Doe v. Bolton. Doe v. Bolton made legal full-term abortions. Washington, D.C. and nine other states allow full-term abortions. So why was that person not convicted? Well. I suspect it's because Oregon is one of those nine states that allows full-term abortion. It's a human. It's a life. It's a person. And I believe in the personhood and that life begins at conception, so absolutely, this person should have been convicted of two capital crimes. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. In addressing this question, I, I think it's really important to focus on solutions to the problem, particularly at the federal level, uh, in dealing with how we use our federal spending with respect to abortion. That's the issue that as a, a congressman, I would have to go back and deal with in Washington, D.C. We absolutely should not be using federal funds to fund abortion, and that's, that's the approach and the tack that we need to take. I've, I was raised with a pro-life consciousness, uh, and, and I very much, uh, my folks, both my folks and my uh, grandparents have been very much involved in, in right to life here in Oregon. Uh, but again, we have, to, we have to direct the conversation to a solutions-based approach. Leave to the penal code for a state what the penal code for a state is going to deal with, but let's focus on what we are going to deal with and how we are going to direct the conversation 
in a way that's going to be productive ultimately. Okay, thank you, Joan. Dr. Webby? I believe the question was whether we would consider it one or two yes. murders. Uh -huh. I would consider that two. Two? Yes. Okay. Uh, Mark? Well, to answer the question, I would consider it two as well. Uh, in my mind, life begins at conception. I read a, a, a good quote here recently by C.L. Bryant. If we can't value the lives that are inside the womb, how can we value the lives that are outside the womb? What does it say to us as a country? Life begins at conception. 56 million lives were ended. 56 million Americans' lives were ended since abortion came into play. That could swing elections. That could change our country. And it's not right, it's murder. So as an answer to the question, it was two lives that were killed that day. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Jason? Well, it's, it's two lives. And uh, so obviously there's a certain degree of, of agreement uh, among the candidates up here. Um, and, but I, I think there's a, there's, there's a kernel of truth here that those of us who are pro-life should be aware of and should emphasize. Um, and that is that even someone who is not pro-life looks at that and thinks it's two people. Looks at that kind of crime, which is not an abortion, it is a murder, and thinks that criminal killed two people. And, I, you know, the difference be, between pro-life and pro-choice, uh, it strikes me, comes down to the view of whether or not the, the baby in the womb is a person, right? That's the, the personhood argument. Um, someone who is pro-choice, I would think, 99% of the time, has to think it's a mass of cells, not a human being. Um, one should obviously question, well, at what point does a human being not become a mass of cells? Um, but uh, I think the, the point here is that the, the conscience of people who are uh, not convicted, as I am, of the personhood of the baby in the womb is still pricked by this kind of crime. And there's an opportunity there for us to, to speak to people who are pro-choice in a way that um, you know, would be persuasive, I think. Um, and we need to do that. It's, this is a very important issue. Um, it goes to the core of our values and how we value human life, not just babies in the womb, but mothers after the baby's born. Um, so uh, again, it's obviously two lives. I want to point out, uh, I've been consistent about pro-life issues and still one in a deep blue district twice. And I'm endorsed by Oregon Right to Life in both of my state rep races and in the Senate primary. Thank you. Okay, we all know that uh, a lot of the agencies under this administration are basically runaway. The one now that's getting a lot of attention is the NSA seemingly spying on everything, everybody. I find it somewhat ironic that Senator Feinstein's a little upset over this one. <laughs> and uh, wouldn't that be interesting if that gets pushed a little bit further? But um, what would you do as a U.S. Senator to bring this agency back into control, number one, and number two, do you think it's out of control? Let's start with uh, Tim. I think that what the recent investigations revealed was that there were some, very, some major red flags that we needed to investigate. Uh, this is ultimately an issue of privacy versus protection, and we have to find that very fine balance between what that means. And, you know, it, it might be interesting to think about it in terms of our largest entities, our largest corporate entities from the private side, and how much information they're able to acquire on each of us. And then find out where the federal government lies with respect to that information. Are private corporations here? As far as individually, are they here and the federal government here? But as a sum total, is the sum total even greater than that? We have to find a way to, to, have, to, to uh, place our government with respect to the amount of information that they have access to right in between that scale. And ultimately it's that balance because the Googleplex was very specifically built just smaller than the Pentagon. Thank you. Dr. Remy? I think the important thing that we have to remember here is that there has to be balance. You know, we can't forget that there are people out there that mean to do us harm. 
You know, we can't forget about what happened in 9-11, but we also have to respect our privacy and our personal freedom. You know, we don't want people listening in on our phone calls and spying on us. But if we don't have any information until after an attack happens, how are we gonna track where the attack happened? So I think this has to be done with appropriate oversight. So if I think that that's the big issue where things get screwed up is when we don't have appropriate oversight, when we have, uh, you know, government or these contractors that have access to this sort of information. It's a real problem. And I, you know, remember our Senator Merkley saying, gee, I didn't know all that stuff was going on. Well, that's because he missed the briefing and went to go be on hardball with Chris Matthews instead of attending uh, the NSA briefing. But I think the key point that we have to make here is that we can't trust this government anymore. And we don't, you know, we've got to protect our country, but if we can't trust our own government with this information, that's where the problem is. And that's what we've got to do is get people back in there that we can trust. Thank you. Mark? Well, the NSA has clearly violated our Fourth Amendment rights. We get our rights from God, not from government. Um, the Constitution and the Bill of Rights restrict the government what they can do with our uh, God-given rights. So to answer the question of what would I do about the NSA, we need to pass legislation to restrict government more in order to make government more limited. I do agree that there needs to be a balance, yes, in order to protect our own national security. But when it comes to violating our Fourth Amendment rights to be secure in our papers and effects, the government has gone too far, and that's tyranny. Thank you. You happen, happen to agree that uh, the NSA is violating the Fourth Amendment. It's interesting that a government agency is uh, routinely, in, in my opinion, routinely and systematically uh, violating the Constitution. This is vast over, it's not just overreach, it's vast overreach by the NSA. They're not, the federal government is not entitled to collect our metadata or our texts or our emails or listen to our phone calls unless we are under a cloud of reasonable suspicion for having committed a crime. This is a, a chip at the foundation of what made this country America, and that's the belief that we need to be protected against the government as much as you know it's protecting us. And I want to propose a novel concept, um, you know, about the, the conversation about private corporations and how much data they can collect. Um, first of all, we should have laws against private corporations ever using private data, whether they're the cell phone provider that happens to uh, uh, you know to be transmitting your texts and your phone calls or not. Um, and furthermore, novel concept number two, what if the government was there to actually protect our privacy and to make sure that those corporations weren't abusing that data? That's what the NSA is doing. That and pointing the gun outward at our enemies. The NSA is, uh, is not a domestic spy agency, or it, sir, it shouldn't be. It should be an agency that is engaged in, in protecting us from our foreign enemies. Um, and, you know, this whole idea that there's any legal reason for them to collect and keep our data is a slippery, slippery slope, and it will result in the loss of our civil rights. Thank you, Jason. Joe Ray? So I decided to look up what the mission what is of the NSA while everybody else was talking, because sometimes you just can't remember everything. But this is what, <laughs> I just found this interesting. The agency also enables network warfare operations to defeat terrorists and their organizations at home and abroad, consistent with U.S. laws and the protection of privacy and civil liberties. They're not even following their own mission statement. So the NSA, their basic role is on cybercrime and to gather intelligence by cyber means, listening in on conversations. Absolutely, they are, have overstepped their bounds, their role, by listening to our phone conversations. In fact, it's quite possible that these phone conversations with our smartphones on are being listened to because they can indeed reverse listen. Your Samsung smart TVs have a reverse listening component on it that you may not even be aware of. 
but it's there. My grandkids have an Xbox 360, and last Christmas I said, what's that noise? He goes, oh, Grandma, it's the other players. I said, can they hear you? Can they hear what's going on in this house? He said, yes. He said, turn that part off immediately. I could just imagine something accidentally being said and the FBI coming down on our front door, living in the political household that we live in. <laughs> this is serious stuff, and we've got to get the NSA back under control or close it down. Thank you. Okay, we all know that uh, Obamacare is a disaster. We all know that there are a lot of Democrats fleeing from it during this election cycle. And we all know that our own two senators have crafted some alternatives to Obamacare. What do you think of them? Let's start with uh, Jason. Well, he, so there were a couple of bills that uh, Senator Wyden was involved in. Um, one dealt with Medicare, ref, uh, Medicare reform that is not uh, related in any way to Obamacare. Medicare is, is separate. Obamacare is uh, commercial insurance. Um, the, the other law that I'm aware of, or bill that I'm aware of, that was co-sponsored by Senator Merkley was the Healthy Americans Act. Um, so it was Ron Wyden and, and uh, Jeff Merkley working together to create a health care reform bill that looks an awful lot like Obamacare. So it includes an individual mandate, it includes IRS enforcement, it includes uh, health insurance exchanges, government um, approved health plans. <laughs> Obviously the NSA is listening to that. <laughs> um, so it's, it's bad. Ta uh, increased taxes on small businesses. Um, it, the only thing it doesn't include is uh, the, the other taxes that Obamacare imposes and will continue to impose over the next few years. It is a very bad bill. It is Obamacare, and I'm opposed to it, um, just as I am to Obamacare and any other attempt uh, to have a top-down, um, one-size-fits-all approach to our health care. Um, and uh, in that respect, it's no different than Obamacare. Thank you. Joe Ray? So I would oppose any of the bills that they put out. Anytime you have the government trying to tell us how we need to be paying for our health, health care is not right. Health insurance market was actually started so that you could pay for your health care to share the risk, spread that risk around. And you had the option to be part of it or to carry the risk totally on your own. And isn't that how it should be? The whole, every one of these plans they come up with, none of them make sense. When I just, and I'm just gonna talk about Obamacare because that's the one that we're dealing with today, not any of these other plans. When the government says you have to pay for maternity care, when you're not planning on ever having a baby again because you're past the childbearing years, you don't plan on the Sarah and Abraham event, why should you be paying for maternity care? It doesn't make sense. We need to go to a plan that's more like a catastrophic plan that's got a high deductible and a low premium, put the difference in the bank account, and then have a cafeteria plan in association with that. For example, on my auto insurance, I can have towing or not have towing. If it's paid off, I can have full coverage or not full coverage. You should be able to do exactly the same thing with your health insurance. Pick the plans that are portable state to state, pick any doctor that you want to go to that fits your lifestyle, not what the government, not what the central government thinks that you need. I am 100% for the full repeal of the Affordable Care Act. Thank you. Jim? You know, health care is a very personal thing. People choose to smoke or drink. People choose not to exercise or to exercise and eat healthy and to live a healthy, natural life. The fact that what we have been given to us is essentially dictating that we must all fall under the same category for a product that they provide us is absolutely wrong. I see this as another attempt to basically hijack an area uh, that the government can then control the population with. And this, is, this is very, very unfortunate. 
And, but what is very fortunate about it is that uh, it has essentially failed. And what we need to do is we need to look at effective ways of repealing it without necessarily advancing an overhaul because trying to get the kind of consensus that we need to overhaul the entire system is not going to work. However, repealing a mandate that forces people to buy this product is the first place to start. That is essentially an effective repeal. So that's what I would advocate for. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Lennon? The plans that I uh, know, or at least um, the issues about uh, health care that I know that Wyden was involved with, the first was the Healthy Americans Act, and that was back about eight or ten years ago. I was president of the Oregon Medical Association at the time, and, and you know the senator, U.S. senator, asked us to review some of the medical components of this part of the bill. But, uh, you know, this bill was not Obamacare. There were 12 Republicans and 12 Democrats, such uh, Republicans, uh, these there were, were co-sponsors, uh, such as Trent Lott and uh, Bob Corker. These were all co-sponsors on this bill. It was budget neutral, and uh, it was free market based, which is nothing like what we've got now with Obamacare. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, we were of course gonna look at this, because you know, the senator's coming to ask you to look, where are you gonna say no? You're Republican, you're Democrat, and I'm Republican, I'm not gonna talk to you. So, I mean, there was, you know, he had some ideas, you know, we've, there, there were problems with our healthcare system and had to get under control, the spending's out of control, we needed some insurance reforms just like we do now. There are problems, and, and so we were trying to come up with a, a good solution, but I by no means was wedded to the bill. I was just looking at some of the medical components and not, you know, I've never been in favor of mandates or any of that, uh, which is why I've opposed this Obamacare from the get-go and stood up and got hate mail and had to change my home phone number for opposing it. I ran uh, in, as a AMA trustee as a conservative change agent because some of us were so upset we were either gonna bail out of the organization or try to infiltrate and change, which is what we did. And I was able to get elected in a two-thirds liberal, uh, liberal-leaning AMA house as somebody that looks at all sides of an issue. And uh, uh, Ron Wyden did come up with a, a premium support alternative for Medicare. That was the Ryan Wyden, oh sorry, uh, it was a Ryan Wyden plan, and uh, that actually could give options to our seniors. Okay, thank you. Well, as a limited government conservative myself, I advocate for full repeal of Obamacare. The uh, government should not be involved in our health care. Our health care is between a patient and a doctor, and that's it. Obamacare is socialism, folks. It's not what our country is about. It's not based in freedom. It needs to be gone. It needs to be gone. It needs to be gone now. So I advocate for full repeal of Obamacare, and not repeal and fix, not repeal and replace, but full repeal. So to answer the question, I'm against the uh, the two bills that were put forward. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, we'll start with Dr. Uh, Webby on this. And are there any federal gun control regulations that you would support? I'm a proud supporter of our Second Amendment, and I think we have plenty of laws on the books already. I don't believe we need any more. And I think we have to be very careful about gradual erosion of our gun rights as more and more of these laws and restrictions are, opposed, are uh, proposed. Um, I, of course, uh, oppose the UN Small Arms Treaty. I think that's an infringement on our constitutional rights. We should not be, our, our Constitution should not be overrun by another organization. I, uh, you know, when we look back at the studies, there was a Harvard study done that uh, looked at different countries with different gun laws, and the ones with the more restrictive gun laws actually had more gun crimes. It was, a, for the most part, inversely proportional. We had an assault weapons ban in place for 10 years, and that did not decrease the number of uh, of uh, firearm problems. So uh, I believe we have enough laws as it is at this time and we do not need any more. Thank you. Mark? Well, as a proud gun owner myself, I strongly support the Second Amendment. 
shall not be infringed means shall not be infringed. Obviously, Jeff Merkley doesn't believe in that because he was one of the 46 senators that voted to for the UN Small Arms Treaty. It was basically like voting against prohibiting it, which is basically voting for it. So, shall not be infringed means shall not be infringed. The Second Amendment is there to defend the First Amendment, and that's what our country was founded upon. That's what we need to get back to. Thank you. Okay. Again, it's it's easier to uh, to know where you stand on these issues if, if you have a, a frame of reference or a principle that you use to look at the Constitution. And um, I, I, I do, I think most of us do, and that is, uh, it actually says what it means. And the original intent of the Constitution is, in fact, important because, uh, uh, you know, if you want to change it, you have to amend it. Um, the Second Amendment is actually very clear. The language is clear, I think. Um, certainly you could argue the, the fringes about what it means to be a well-regulated militia, but the point is uh, the right to keep and bear arms is in the Constitution. It is the number two amendment, um, and if, in my opinion, if, if people don't like it, and if enough people don't like it, well, they should amend the Constitution. I actually um, had a very interesting conversation about this when I was in law school, and. Um, I know you'll find this shocking, but the faculty at Harvard Law School is overwhelmingly liberal. <laughs> yeah, it, it's true. I know. Not, not, not a widely known fact, but uh, so my constitution, uh, constitutional law professor, uh, nice enough guy, but he was certain that the Constitution was a living document, and I pretty much came to the conclusion that that meant it meant whatever he thought it should mean, and. Uh, so I'm sure, I, uh, actually I shouldn't say that, I don't know what grade I got in constitutional law, but um, I disagree, I think it's clear, we, we have sufficient gun regulation now and uh, would not be voting for additional restrictions on uh, various aspects of firearm ownership. Okay. Thank you. Joe Ray? I too am a very strong supporter of the Second Amendment, but there is a, Federal regulation, amazingly, that I would like to see changed in regards to guns, and that would be if you have a concealed carry license, it should be good if you're in Oregon, or California, or New Hampshire, or Wyoming, Hawaii, and a bunch of other states. That all 50 of them and our territories to boot. It is, I think it is crazy to expect somebody to memorize the state laws in every state in which they happen to travel to, if they're doing a cross-country drive or, or, you know, however they're going from state to state, you go, okay, wait a minute, am I allowed to keep this on me concealed or do I have to lock this in the glove box or does it have to be as far away from me as possible, like an open container? Um, you know, the gun is not gonna just jump up and we all know that and, and start shooting. We haven't seen that happen yet, except for in the cartoons. Um, so these federal controls are just more ways to start to usurp our freedom and our liberty that as United States Senator, I will swear to uphold and that every person in the military swore to uphold and we need to have the right to bear those arms. Our founders knew exactly why they put that in there and that was to protect themselves not only from criminals but from a government that is out of control and is on version on tyranny. Thank you. I would not I would not support any further regulation on the restriction of gun ownership at the federal level. Uh, the only legislation I would consider would be the reciprocity across state lines. I think that that's a very important issue but also should be looked at cautiously because of the propensity of federal government to fall down a slippery slope. And if they are some way able to uh, recognize concealed weapon permits and other, other permits for possession uh, from a legislative standpoint, then they could very well take that power forward and expand upon that. So I would, I would hesitate uh, and I would, I would be prudent and cautious about how we approach this. But yes, if there's, if there's a single uh, issue that I would support in terms of federal regulation, it would be reciprocity state by state. Great. 
All right, I want to be cautious of the time, and we are approaching 8 o'clock, and uh, we will, I'm going to ask one more question, and then we are going to give each candidate uh, time to give some closing remarks. Uh, a lot of questions that we didn't get to, but let me just give you the topics, and maybe you can be thinking about them and respond to them quickly in your closing statement. Uh, some are concerned about cutting the defense budget. A lot of people want to know what you may do to curb federal spending without raising taxes, and where are you with the Defense of Marriage Act? My last question, however, <clears throat> deals with the Middle East. As we know, it's very unstable, and the current administration doesn't seem to be standing with our strongest ally, Israel. What is your position on the United States relationship with Israel? We'll start with Jason. Israel is one of those uh, special relationships the United States has with our strongest allies. It, it is a key ally in a, uh, in a very unstable region. Um, and it is uh, a country that the United States has participated in, in building, um, in, in uh, allowing it to become uh, a democracy. And uh, I think we absolutely should stand strong with our allies. Um, one of the problems that is in the, the subtext of uh, Mr. Atkinson's question is uh, that we have telegraphed to our enemies abroad that we are not decisive, that we are not committed to our allies, that we are not, in fact, going to do what we say we're going to do, so there's no need to worry about it if we threaten to do something. And what does that do? It emboldens our enemies. We, we are living in a strange time where we've gone from the superpower Cold War situation kind of through a time of being the sole superpower and now we see regional powers aggressive regional powers trying to rise up um, and taking aggressive action and of course I'm talking about Russia and and it's essentially invasion of Ukraine um, and it, we are unable or unwilling to do anything about it because we've been, been put in a position where we really can't um, you know how could we deal with something like the Ukraine we could uh, ship more of our energy resources to Europe so they're not as dependent on uh, natural gas from Russia. Um, we could be, uh, we, we certainly shouldn't be cutting our defense budget so that we weaken our position and our ability to uh, enforce threats and support our allies against our adversaries when they act like that. I mean, be careful because we are uh, certainly in a, a world where conventional wars are still possible. If we cut, cut our defense budget, we endanger our soldiers, we endanger our citizens, and we weaken our, our position in the world. All right, thank you. Joe Ray? I'm a very strong supporter of Israel and their right to exist and to exist in all of that land that has been theirs for thousands of years that they were expelled from. There's a scripture in the Bible that says, Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And all who love her will be blessed and prosper. And I find it interesting that this one nation, the size of Rhode Island, approximately one third of the world's media is based there in Israel. Why? What is it about this little <coughs> teeny tiny country that has upset the entire world? that she would become the millstone around the neck of all nations. Isn't that rather interesting? Because God, according to the Bible, put his mark on that place. We need to stand by Israel. Israel is our only true ally. And to even back off of that is not good for this country whatsoever. And as your next United States Senator, I will do everything that I can in my power to make sure that we keep that allegiance very strong and very clear. Thank you. Thank you. Since 1948, Israel has been a longtime ally of the United States uh, under President Harry Truman uh, and in, in recognizing the state of Israel. It's very important for us to, to consider the fact that we've more or less exhausted our ability to mediate the conflict that is there. Uh, what we need to do is continue to stand by Israel as an ally. 
but also be but also be understanding and aware of the fact that Israel itself is surrounded by uh, hostile is, is in a very hostile environment and knowing that we also can see coming from them and from the administration there uh, uh, somewhat of a, a hawkish approach to some of its neighbors and if we were to follow the, those uh, their directions word for word we might end up in confrontation that might be unwanted so in that regard we need to be we need to be cognizant of where they are we need to be uh, a ready partner to, to help them in situations of, of, of drastic conflict and be ready to uh, stand next to Israel in, in their time of need. Thank you. Dr. Webby? I want to ask you if anybody out there knows what our foreign policy is. <laughs> Do we have a foreign policy? Golden rule. I mean, our friends can't trust us. They don't know if we're going to be there when they need us. Our enemies don't fear us anymore. We draw red lines and they get crossed and so. I mean, you know, look at it's what, what's happening. And, and when there's a vacuum of leadership like that, you can be sure somebody else is going to fill it. And when it's not us, look who's filling it now. Look at Putin. And I can guarantee you that the people that are going to fill that vacuum are not going to be as benevolent as we are and as respectful of other countries as we are. So I think that it's important that we continue to provide some stability or else this whole world is going to fall into chaos and we're all going to be much more unsafe. Okay, thank you. Mark? Well, the situation in the Middle East has uh, escalated over the years, as we all know. I'm 100% pro-Israel. I think we should support Israel. We're talking about religious freedom here. We're talking about Israel that chooses to be a different religion, practice different religion than its neighbors around it. So I strongly support religious freedom, and I think we should strong, strongly support Israel. Thank you. Jason? I started on that one, but I can answer oh, did you? again oh. if you want. <laughs> it is late. Okay. For those of us who get up at 4 o'clock. You know there's two 4 o'clocks in the same day. Uh, okay. I really encourage you to stick around and talk to them individually. They'll be at their various tables. And I want to say thank you to all the candidates. This has been terrific. And uh, you've handled yourself with great decorum. And I just want to say thank you for coming to Dr. Trump. We wish you all the best, and the bottom line is Jeff Berkeley needs to go on vacation for a long time. I'm going to give you all 90 seconds, uh, and I realize that's not a whole lot of time, but I think we have a pretty good feel, and uh, to uh, make your closing statement, and again, thank you so very much for coming and being with us tonight. Let me start with Dr. Uh, Webby. As you, as you all know, I'm a pediatric neurosurgeon, and um, there's no greater honor to me than when I take a patient back to the operating room with their parents, and the parents are holding that baby, that infant, their most precious gift that they have. And there's something wrong, something with their brain, something with their spinal cord, it's always something very serious. And when those parents hand that baby to me and say, Dr. Webby, take care of my baby. And I'm very concerned about those babies. And I'm very concerned about my four children and the opportunities that we're going to be leaving for our children. I always ask our groups, how many of you think your children are going to have the same opportunity that we had growing up? Anybody here? Isn't that sad when you think of all of the generation before us that fought and died to give us what we have and look what's happening to it i think it's time that we ask ourselves who controls our life senator merkley barack obama think that you need a massive 
federal bureaucracy to dictate, mandate, control, regulate every single aspect of your life because you don't know how to do it yourself. I believe in the individual. I believe we don't want to be micromanaged. Merkley voted 95% of the time with Obama. We're more independent minded than that. We're a red state with two blue islands and we are independent. We want the ability to have our American dream. So I ask you to join with me and uh, I ask for your support so that we can all pull together and beat Jeff Merkley. Uh, I'm going to switch over here. Go with Tim. Go around the other way. Uh, well, I want to thank you all for being here tonight and uh, for listening and for providing us with questions that, that we can answer and, and, and hopefully provide some solutions to. Uh, I, I'm definitely uh, I'm a proud Oregonian and born and raised, and, it, and it's, uh, it's been fantastic so far to travel this state and to learn so much about the other Oregonians out there. Uh, you know, what we hope to bring is skills in negotiation and advocacy. Uh, we, we hope to bring to Washington, D.C., uh, an understanding of macroeconomic policy, which, which is where we actually need to uh, hit Jeff Merkley hard. That's going to be a very important spot because of the legislation that he has been a part of. Uh, also in foreign policy, our campaign brings a significant degree of experience in foreign policy, and we hope to bring that to Washington, D.C., and provide some leadership uh, internationally uh, in, our, in our nation's capital. And finally, um, you know, our, our campaign and some of the work that I've done previously has been in entitlements and, and understanding social, so, social security disability. And that's going to be a very important part of where we save money in the future, where we find out uh, how we are wasting our resources as a nation. And so looking, looking at that, looking at uh, streamlining and making more efficient our government so our resources are, are saved and, and, and so that our future, in essence, is preserved. Uh, all of these things that we are hoping to bring to Washington, D.C., and we ask for your vote. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you again, everybody, for coming out tonight. It, it, it really does mean a lot, I'm sure, to, to all of us to see this type of concern of what is going on in this country. Experience comes in all sorts of flavors. Our founding fathers believed that you should be a citizen first. Raise your families, take care of your businesses, be involved in your local communities. If you go online and look on my website at perkinsforussenate.com and go to my bio, read all the things that I was involved in. There's a lot there. One lady, when she introduced me a couple weeks ago, said she was exhausted just reading the list. But our founders also said, if you feel called, go serve your country for a limited period of time. I feel called, and that is why I'm here. That is the big reason. For a limited period of time, I promise that I will not look at a second term until I've been there for four years. And then if I run for a second term and am blessed enough to be reelected, I will retire after two terms. Yay. I... <laughs> Our founders said limited. They meant limited. So I have a large, vast experience. But that financial planning and treating the people's money like the people's money is so important. $17.5 trillion of current debt. And let me give this to you real quick. If I give you a million dollars a day to spend every day, it will take you roughly 2,739 years to spend $1 trillion. And folks, our government is spending that every single year, more than what they're bringing in. The madness has to stop. We can't afford the lattes. We can't afford a million dollars to study romance novels. And that is things that our government is spending money on. Again, I will stand for, tr I will be truthful with you at all times and I will stand firm on the Constitution. I'm asking for your prayers, your support, and your vote on May 20th. My name is Joe Ray Perkins. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, this is a Republican primary, and we need to choose the candidate who is best equipped to defeat Jeff Merkley and then go to the U.S. Senate and be the best advocate for us uh, that we can, we can have. That means someone who can unite Republicans, 
someone who can appeal to Democrats and independents, and someone who uh, <clears throat> has the ability to win in tough elections, because this is gonna be a tough election. Let's not kid ourselves. This is gonna be hard to win. I have proven the ability to do all three of those things. And I will win this race with your help. We also need to keep in mind, that, you know, I refer to my opening to not abandoning our values. I actually believe we have to contrast with the Democrat. People are looking for something different, something more honest, something more truthful and open, rather than the same political spin that they get every election cycle. And that doesn't mean running away from your principles, it means embracing them. And that means being different from the Democrat on things like health care, taxes, life, marriage, all of those things, guns. We have that opportunity in 2014 because Jeff Merkley, frankly, has provided it for us. We've got to take this opportunity and win this election just to prove that we can do it to the rest of Oregon and also to change the majority in the United States Senate because that's what's at stake. Ultimately, that's what we're running for here. This is a very important election for Oregon and for the entire country. We can win it, we will win it, we will restore the American dream for young people and, and everyone. Um, and in doing so, when we do it, we will prove what Ronald Reagan said, which is that America's days are still yet to come. The best days are still yet to come. I'm Jason Carter, I hope I will earn your vote in May. Thanks. Thank you. What? Well, thank you first for coming, all of you, tonight. I uh, really appreciate being here and taking the time to uh, listen to all the candidates. As I stated in my opening statement, it's just about one thing to me, and that one thing is freedom. I recently watched a movie, uh, City Slickers, it has Jack Collins in it, and throughout that movie, he talks about one thing, and that one thing is something you have to figure out yourself. Ladies and gentlemen, that one thing, as I said, is freedom to me, and it's just that simple. We have our government, that is spying on us with the NSA. We have IRS targeting us. We have political correctness that will be the death of our great nation. That's not what our country is about. Our country is about that one thing. And that one thing is freedom. We need to take our country back. Jeff Merkley is about big government. Jeff Merkley is about telling us how we can live our lives as opposed to us living our lives on our own and making our own decisions. We have things like Common Core, we have things like Obamacare that need to go away, they're socialism, they're evil. <coughs> we need a senator that's going to stand up there with Ted Cruz, stand up there with Rand Paul and with Mike Lee, and not back down until our freedom is restored. Ladies and gentlemen, we are Americans here, and we are not afraid. I'm Mark Callahan, I'm running for the U.S. Senate against Jeff Merkley. Let's get to work. Thank you, and may God bless America. Well, again, thank you all.